to speak against these amendments, but to support the noble Lord Lord Shinquin in bringing this bill forward. Uh, the noble Baroness Lady Tong won't be surprised that we take a diametrically opposed view on this, uh, not for the first time in our lives, or indeed with the noble Baroness uh, who, Lady Barker, who's sitting in front of her. Indeed, the reason I left their party, they all recall, was when they put a proposition that abortion should become a party policy rather than a conscience question. And I'm I've always been saddened that this should be a politicised issue in this way because I think that people can hold diametrically opposed views and they can be perfectly sincerely held and for perfectly good reasons. Both the Noble Baroness and the Noble Lord Lord Winston, of course, have spoken as, as doctors. I, I'm only the, uh, the humble father of a doctor, but I did have the chance earlier this week to speak to two very eminent doctors, one of whom is a former president of one of the Royal Colleges and the other a former president of the VMA, both of whom are opposed to this amendment. One, because of the danger of misdiagnosis, and she gave me a specific example of a baby that had been born who ha whose mother had been told that the baby would have a fatal fetal disability, and that didn't turn out to be the case. And the other, because she said it is far better to go ahead with the pregnancy and for the baby to be delivered in order to help the mother at that stage. And I'm going to come back to that point, if I may, in a moment, because that is borne out by the guidance of the Royal College of Gynaecologists in the submission they made on this subject in 2010. Now, we can disagree about these things, but let's at least accept that there is a disagreement. I wish that the noble Lord Lord Winston had been able to bring his amendment forward at committee stage, when we would have been able to have a more robust argument and discussion about this. It did seem strange to me that at 24 hours notice before report stage that this amendment would be laid before your Lordship's house. But since it had been laid, I've done my best to discuss it with others who know more about these things than, than I do. Though I might add that in 1990, when a member of another place, I moved, the only amendment I had moved in my 18 years in the House of Commons, on which there was an equality of votes. Uh, and Mr Speaker Weverall, who became Lord Weverall, had to use his casting vote for the status quo. And I know through my discussions with him subsequently, because he was one of my two sponsors when I became a member of your Lordship's House, how disturbed he was that he wasn't able to follow his conscience but had to follow precedent that day in upholding the status quo. What my amendment sought to do was to ensure that in the 1990 uh, amendment to the 1967 Abortion Act, but at least the nature of the disability would be placed on the green form authorising the abortion. And I was challenged at the time by Harriet Harman, who said that it was scaremongering, scaremongering for Professor John Finnis, one of the leading experts on jurisprudence in this country, to suggest that, as drafted, that the legislation could lead to abortion on the grounds of cleft palate. Well, my Lords, as we all know from the figures that have been produced post-24 weeks gestation, there have been abortions on the grounds of cleft palate. And notwithstanding the examples the noble lord gave us a few moments ago, 90% of all babies diagnosed with Down syndrome in this country are now routinely aborted. I've never described the Department of Health as being responsible for eugenics, and I would never do that, nor do I believe that doctors in this country are responsible for eugenics. I think what the noble Lord, Lord Chinquin has said is that a society slides into eugenics when these things become normative. And so I hope that the noble Lord, when he comes to reply at the end of the debate, will tell us exactly what the list, the list of disabilities is that cannot be diagnosed before 24 weeks gestation. Because despite my own strongly held views about the law, and indeed there are Eight million abortions have taken place in this country since 1967, around 600 every working day, one in five pregnancies now ended on those grounds. This bill isn't about that. This bill is about equality legislation and discrimination and whether a child with a disability should be treated differently from an able-bodied child. And I would simply point out to your Lordships that there is a certain irony that the debate that we had just before we met which was on car parking, the very last words spoken by the minister from the dispatch box was about ensuring equality of opportunity for disabled people to be able to park in car parking spaces. My Lords, all of members of your Lordship's House have properly campaigned over the years and have a, you have a huge reputation in the country for asserting the rights of disabled people. But isn't there an inconsistency if we work for ramps on 
public buildings in this country, but say it would be better that someone with a disability was not born in the first place. What sort of message does that send? My Lords, um, I would like to mention one or two other things. I don't think people like me can get up and put arguments like this if we're just anti-things. And one of the things I got involved in in my own city in Liverpool was the building of the first baby hospice in the country, Zoe's Place, of which I continue to be a patron. It was built specifically, and there are others now that have been opened following it, to help mothers in this situation. You have to be positively for, yes, the unborn child, but for the mother as well, in these tragic and very, very difficult circumstances. I admire medicine when it's at its best. And the noble Lord, Lord Winston and I, who sometimes disagree, but nevertheless he knows I admire hugely a lot of the work that he has done. When noble lords like Lord Winston are able to develop, as they are doing, surgery in utero to deal with things like spina bifida, that is good science and good medicine, marching hand in hand with good ethics. But if I were to say to the noble Baroness Lady Barker, for instance, that I was in favour of abortion beyond 24 weeks for reasons like gender or race or if it could be diagnosed for orientation, what would your lordship say to me? I hope that you would rebuke me. And that is why I argue that I think we should treat disability in precisely the same way. Let me wind up my remarks. The Royal College of Gynaecologists, I said I would return to what they have to say. There were two things, that, one of which shocked me when I read the details of what actually happens uh, in a late <coughs> abortion of this kind. They say, the, the, this is their description, not mine, intracardiac potassium chloride is the recommended method to ensure fetal acetylstole. After aspiration of fetal blood to confirm correct placement of a needle, two to three millimeters strong is injected into the cardiac ventricle. A repeat injection may be required. And it goes on to describe other ways of doing this. This is a late abortion. Babies have been born and lit from 23 weeks gestation, my lords. So this is, this is beyond viability that we are talking about. They also say, and I referred to this uh, in parenthesis, they say that most women will be unaware that within the NHS, medical abortion induced by drugs is the procedure usually offered after 14 weeks gestation. The prospect of labouring to deliver a dead fetus will be difficult for many, and discussions about the procedure will require sensitive handling by experienced staff. Although the prospect of labour in these circumstances is especially daunting, some women gain some satisfaction from having given birth and have welcomed the chance to hold their baby. And they go on to say they talk about pain relief for the, uh, the options that need to be offered for pain relief and whether the woman might want to see the baby and have mementos such as photographs, hand and foot hand and footprint. She will be made aware of information from post-mortem. These discussions are likely to be distressing for the woman and her partner. So let's be very clear, my lords, this is a tragedy for everyone that is involved. And then we come to the noble lord's actual amendment. He says in the amendment that there is a high probability that the fetus will die. My lords, we're drafting legislation here. What does this mean? Is it 99.99990% or is probability 50%? How should a high probability be objectively defined in law? And why isn't that specified in the wording of the amendment? And also, my lords, and this really <coughs> disturbs me, the Noble Lords Amendment says that you may go on to carry out these procedures, and I quote, shortly after delivery. Shortly after delivery, when the baby has been born alive. My lords, is this a matter of minutes, hours, days, weeks, months? or arguably even years. It needs to be clearly defined in law, otherwise it would be interpreted far too widely. That is why this amendment should really have been brought forward at committee stage when we could have had a proper discussion about it. But I hope, my Lords, that this amendment will be resisted and that the noble Lord, Lord Chinquin's bill, will be given a safe passage so that this proper debate, it's about ethics, it is a proper debate, and I hope it will have the chance to go forward and be properly debated in another place.